All right, this talk is about uh, the gear pump materializer. Uh, if you've been following talks uh, in this conference about uh, Ocket Streams at all, this is a type of materializer that uh, is uh, different than the actor materializer, which is the default materializer. Aka Streams uh, will allow you to do different materializers, and uh, this one is, uh, is catering toward uh, distributed semantics. So it's, uh, it's, it's by definition a technical presentation. Uh, it's assumed some familiarity with the Aka Streams flow and graph DSLs. There will be some examples in that. Some familiarity with uh, big time and real time streaming systems. Uh, and uh, some familiarity with Scala. Um, I don't have any Java examples. Um, the uh, material, the gear pump materializer, is an effort uh, between the uh, Aka Streams team and the gear pump teams that started late last year. Uh, it was initiated by by Jonas, uh, CTO of, of Lightbend, and uh, we uh, felt the fit was was very good. He was looking for a distributed engine that was primarily in Akka uh, that could, uh, could could match well with the Akka Streams uh, philosophy, the Akka Streams programming paradigm. And uh, unlike other real-time streaming systems, uh, Gear Pump depends heavily on, on Akka. We don't have much else um, as opposed to uh, certain systems that bring in, for example, a Zookeeper or, or, or other uh, maybe Hadoop uh, ecosystem components. Um, it uh, resulted over, uh, since we started, in a number of pull requests to master <clears throat> to the GitHub repro of Akka streams to enable different uh, materializers uh, where GearPump uh, was driving some of the changes. Uh, most were related to exposing graph stage variables or module variables, and I'll, I'll get into that a bit more, uh, and uh, this conference is a good is a good conference in terms of timing. It's close to completion. Uh, we can run many of the examples. It's fairly seamless to to run many of the examples. Uh, you um, just change the actor materializer, which is an implicit, to the gear pump materializer, and you switch between local and distributed uh, like magic. So who am I? I'm a, a committer on a gear pump, uh, Apache gear pump, and uh, an architect on an Intel uh, platform, uh, open source project called Trusted Analytics Platform. Uh, both URLs I invite you to, lo to look at. Uh, and over the years, I've been in other companies in various uh, positions. So, so what is uh, Apache gear pump? Uh, it is an incubating project. Um, uh, typically, the Apache folks like to have incubating whenever I say Apache, so uh, I might be in trouble for, for this slide, but uh, it's incubating, uh, which means uh, you basically have a year to prove your worth before you're promoted to uh, top level. What does worth mean? It's how much... Um, buy-in you have from the community. Uh, it's weighed in a variety of ways. Uh, stars on GitHub, um, a level of interest, perhaps um, integration with other Apache uh, uh, projects. So there's a variety of ways. Um, the, the, uh, the way I like to think of it is uh, you've, been invited, you've been invited to the, the horse race and <clears throat> the incubation is when the gates open. So you have uh, you have some time to build and invite a community of people. There are many people that, um, unless you make Apache, are not essentially are uh, not 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 all that interested in contributing. So it serves as a motivation to get contributors and committers. As I mentioned, it uh, leverage, leverages the actor model uh, and Akka. Uh, Gear Pump has some features like dynamic DAG, or uh, the ability to add nodes to the runtime model uh, dynamically. Uh, it also has uh, some really nice runtime visualization of uh, both the, uh, the cluster and the application DAGs that have been submitted. Um, and lastly, 
It has one of the best uh, data performance profiles uh, on par, and in some cases exceeding Flink, uh, that uh, covers both throughput and latency. And uh, we've uh, submitted uh, these profiles to a variety of places. So it's a production-ready system is, is what, it, what, what should be imparted here. So what, uh, what will we be talking about uh, today? Uh, the first and foremost is uh, why integrate ACA streams into a big data platform? You know, what, what are our motivations? Um, why do it? Um, what, what does a different type of materializer that is distributed by you? Um, the second one is what type of features are evolving in big data platforms? What are they moving towards? Are they moving toward a feature set that uh, pairs well with ACA streams? Uh, is ACA streams perhaps constrained or limited by features and big data that uh, no longer are applicable to, uh, to, to ACA streams? Uh, so we look a little about that. Uh, and then um, given that you have a big data platform, uh, suppose you're on another real-time streaming system like Flink, for example, what, what features do you need to make sure you've implemented in order to pair well and integrate easily with, with ACA streams? So we look at it almost from the opposite direction of uh, big data. It's rather what, uh, what big data needs to have in order to integrate into ACA streams. And then, um, assuming uh, you are interested, uh, especially within the audience, of... Uh, of implementing a materializer, uh, what are the integration challenges? What parts of ACA streams present, uh, present difficult challenges um, that uh, are either not doable or just are more trouble than it's worth within your particular distributed system? As an example, Spark, which is a mini-batch system, there are uh, features within ACA streams that would make integrating a mini batch system uh, fairly difficult. So. And then for the, uh, the people that are looking at uh, how the materializer is implemented, we I review the object models, the ACA streams object model, and the GearPub object model. And then finally, I get into the actual materialization process for both the uh, default actor materializer and the GearPub materializer. So uh, the first question, which is why, uh, ACA streams in its uh, current incarnation using Okta actor materializer is, um, is limited to the scope of a single JVM. Um, although actors themselves are very good at remoting, um, the ACA streams implementation is pretty much within a particular JVM. This, of course, doesn't, doesn't do very well within a big data platform or anything at scale of uh, throughput and latency on any big data platform are going to be scaling beyond single JVMs. Um, the, second ish, uh, the, the second aspect is the, um, the Xtreme's DSL is a superset of the other DSLs or APIs you find out there. Um, fundamentally, it uh, has a declarative or a logical plan that is part of the ACA Streams API or DSL that then can be transformed into an execution plan. In uh, the ACA Streams jargon, it has a flow or uh, a set of graph stages that can be materialized into runtime. Um, lastly, the uh, programming paradigm within ACA Streams itself is uh, declarative, composable, extensible, stackable, and reusable. Uh, I should mention that most big data platforms do well on declarative and do well on composability, meaning you can do Spark, flat map, followed by filter, followed by map. Uh, most of them do not do well on extensibility, stackability, and reusability. So what does uh, extensible mean? Um, in terms of ACA streams, it means uh, you can take the graph stage, which is effectively their workhorse type, and extend it. So you can have customized uh, graph stages. 
you can also extend the, uh, the peer type source sync flow or bidirectional flow. And uh, all of these types derive from graph. So um, if you have a particular type of source of which the, um, the Kafka Aka streams talk was an example of that, uh, it's easy to provide that functionality by extending source. You may have a specific syncs. And uh, Conrad's talk earlier mentioned the number of connectors they have out there. The connectors are basically uh, customized versions of, of or customized implementations of source or sync. Um, well, what does stackable mean? Uh, stackable is perhaps a, a bit of an opaque reference to a Cleasley uh, theoretical category theory data structure, which are a concept, which basically means uh, for any node or any graph stage in the graph, uh, you can nest it. So for a particular flow, you can nest in that another flow, another graph, and it's infinitely nestable. So uh, it allows um, a topology to be embedded within another topology. This is fairly unique um, in Aka streams. It's not really uh, there in the other, uh, the other uh, especially within big data, the other uh, frameworks out there. Um, so it's a feature that allows you to do a variety of things. Um, probably the biggest is reuse. Um, given you can take a topology and embed it or nest it anywhere in an existing topology, you can, um, you can provide a new flows or new sources or new sinks. Um, in, in a variety of ways. Um, and this happens not only in a declarative sense before you run, uh, it also can happen dynamically. So Aka Stream's recent feature is uh, something they call hubs. And uh, on our short list of features we're implementing um, as part of the materializer is to uh, use GearPump's dynamic DAG feature and pair it with, uh, with Aka Streams hubs. So let's talk uh, briefly about uh, the big data platform uh, and have what that landscape looks like. Um, I would say within the last year, um, certainly beginning with Storm, there's been an explosion of, of big data platforms. Um, all of them doing, in many cases, similar things. Um, and they all have uh, composable declarative uh, APIs. They all have, for example, flat map or filter or ways to compose a pipeline. Um, this explosion or preponderance of platforms will eventually give way to a consolidation of types. One, uh, one Apache project that's attempting to tackle that is Apache Beam, where they want to be, and there are articles along these lines, an Uber API, where uh, Beam will allow you to code once, uh, sort of the old Java promise. You code once, and you execute in a variety of ways. So for Apache Beam, it means you would have different runners a runner being Flink, a runner being Spark, a runner being GearPump, of which we've uh, submitted a runner to the Apache Beam project. And then uh, you've coded once, and uh, you have a variety of runtimes to pick from. The use, uh, the use of this is, for example, uh, Flink may give you a performance profile that is superior to Spark. You don't want to recode your application uh, or waste uh, time in recoding the application to the, uh, the Flink API. So you just make a configuration switch, and now you have Flink running your application. The, um, in, in a similar way, Aka Streams is approaching the problem uh, like, like Apache Beam, which is a, this uh, sort of um, phenomenal uh, programming paradigm 
that, as I mentioned, has many uh, valuable attributes. And you do it once. And uh, given uh, a choice of materializers, you invoke a particular materializer uh, to run it or to materialize the graph. Beyond Beam, however, there's the opportunity within Aka Streams to have multiple materializers. Since a graph is stackable or can be nested, you may have part of the graph that you decide should be run by gear pump, another part that could be run by the default actor materializer, maybe another part being run by Flink, for example. It allows you to slice and dice a pipeline or um, a graph in a way that uh, Beam and other big data platforms do not, do not provide. So uh, it's, it's, um, it's a type of paradigm that warrants um, uh, being distributed and warrants uh, programming to it. Um, there uh, obviously are side-by-side -side comparisons should a Beam committer be in the room. I imagine uh, they can make uh, fairly good arguments as to why you would pick Beam. Uh, the point being is they're approaching the problem in the same way, and it's similar in some ways to what happened with SQL. There was a consolidation of the grammar into a common declarative grammar that uh, different execution engines then take and execute it. In this case, we, the idea would be we have one flat map or one uh, particular graph stage, one particular pipeline segment, that then is executed in a variety of ways, either they're runners or, uh, or materializers, uh, that, that being the primary point. The second uh, evolving feature in big data platforms is that um, they will increasingly require dynamic pipelines. Uh, these pipelines need to be uh, compositional and reusable. And they're uh, just from the field, there are Two good examples of dynamic DAGs and what, or dynamic pipelines, and why you would why you would need them. The first, and perhaps the foremost, given um, given the preponderance of ML news and applications in recent recent uh, months, is machine learning. The machine learning use case is um, effectively uh, the dynamic aspects are you may need to replace or update a scoring model. Machine learning, for those that aren't familiar with the paradigm, is you train a model, uh, typically a data scientist trains a model with labeled data or with data that, um, that can render the model useful in a production data stream in a production environment. Um, and then you place the scoring part of that model, uh, or it could be a separate model, but it understands the data stream and can um, score it in terms of an um, a, a approximation of certainty uh, or a confidence uh, level. So in the machine learning use cases, you may need to replace a scoring engine. You may need to update the scoring engine in terms of the feature set it's using. You also may need uh, to uh, influence or change a model ensemble. A model ensemble is really uh, a graph of different models. Um, and uh, within ML um, production environments, you may have trained a particular model or, or models and find that uh, the production data stream is no longer rendering the confidence or the scores that you expected. And it can either be do it can either happen because of data drift or concept drift. An example of data drift would be um, uh, you have uh, a Macy's or uh, some department store that sells women's shoes and they expect a certain uh, a certain number of shoes to be bought in particular volumes on particular days. Uh, there's been a recent, um, say, very popular uh, figure, woman that uh, wears a different type of shoe. So your data drift is now uh, 
uh, no longer reflecting what the model says would be the average profile of shoes bought. Um, if uh, women decided they no longer liked shoes, uh, you would have a concept drift. So these sorts of things require uh, dynamic, uh, it can require dynamic changes. In the, ca in the case uh, I mentioned, you could probably quiesce the system, shut down all servers, and restart. But in many cases, uh, you don't have that option. The IoT use cases that uh, big data platforms are also evolving towards are um, that require dynamic, dynamic features are uh, new sensors. Uh, you may have uh, at the edge, not in the, 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 not in the cloud, new sensors that are coming online. Uh, it could be uh, sensors within a manufacturing environment. Or you may need to tweak sensors. Uh, say you've uh, updated a particular pump or a particular piece of machinery on an oil rig, you may need to update the configuration parameters for that new piece of hardware. So uh, these sorts of things require changes, uh, typically at runtime, uh, that uh, big data platforms are beginning to embrace. Um, so the idea, the idea here is to uh, impart what big data is moving toward and how well Akka Streams does in this environment, which, which is part of this talk. So given you have a big data platform, uh, what are the minimum prerequisites you need to have uh, in order to integrate Aka Streams? Uh, you need a system that does both push and pull. This uh, may seem intuitive, but many systems, real-time streaming systems, do not do uh, this, uh, this type of model. They're either all push, or, or I'll pull. Uh, a lot of them um, do push, but are sensitive to back pressure um, hints or back pressure indicators so that their a push is throttled. Um, in order to port all of the graph stages in Aqua Streams, you need to uh, have a model that does, does both and does both well. Uh, the other thing, of course, which most big data platforms do do is back pressure. Back pressure is features that Spark, Beam, Flink, and others are, um, have made sure they, they, do, they do well. There are um, use cases where, and uh, platforms where back pressure is not correctly propagated. You may have back pressure that only occurs between two nodes, which is insufficient. You need to back pressure all the way back up to the source where the source can uh, slow down its rate of emission. Of course, uh, if you're scaling on big data, you need uh, parallelization, uh, the ability to take uh, multiple sources, for example. Uh, a, a very good example is Kafka. Kafka, you may want uh, one group ID, but many clients reading from different partitions. This is the way you can scale Kafka. This is something we had to do with uh, GearPump for uh, uh, NASDAQ proof of concept where they wanted 7 million messages per second sustained. Um, and uh, we did it via uh, paralyzing the partition reads from Kafka. So your big data platform has to be um, aware of and capable of doing parallelization not only at the source or sync, but within uh, particular flows. Of course, um, it has to be asynchronous. This we get for free from the actor model. And in more and more cases, it has to be bidirectional. There may be um, feedback loops or implicit flows that circle back that um, many big data platforms do not do well on. They're, they're typically pure DAG impl uh, pipelines, uh, meaning uh, directed acyclic graphs. They do not, they're not graphs that accommodate uh, loops. So if you're, uh, if you're looking at uh, a materializer uh, and, and uh, what 
big data platforms are available to make the materializer work well. These, these five features are, are things that you need to look at. Uh, you can fail on, on any one of these. Um, it means that your ability to do all custom stages is limited. Depending on what you fail on, it, it may, be, uh, may be fairly severe in the API you can deliver under Aqua Streams. So uh, what were GearPump's challenges uh, as we wrote the GearPump materializer? Um, and this is specific to particular custom st or particular stages, graph stages within uh, within Aqua Streams. One that uh, is uh, a number of uh, custom st uh, stages have is the uh, concept of completion or the concept of cancellation. Uh, examples being balance, uh, completion, merge, or split. And uh, these, I think, came about when the Aqua Streams team was uh, was building custom or building stages for HTTP. HTTP has, of course, short-lived source streams. Uh, they have uh, fairly rigid completion semantics. They have, um, in several cases, merge semantics, and they have uh, split semantics where. You read from one, one stream, and then you continue on a different stream. Um, uh, so I think their sweet spot or their first target for, uh, uh, for what they would, they would move it on to was Spray, which had um, uh, many of these uh, concepts. The, uh, the second area that is an integration challenge for, or was an integration challenge for GearPump was there, um, some of the uh, stages within Aqua Streams have um, particular either upstream or downstream ordering or timing semantics. Uh, for example, Batch would want you to read from one upstream in a particular number quiesce that upstream, read from the second one, and read from the third one. Um, uh, similar with uh, concat, um, delay, they want one of the streams to be quiesced for a particular time. Delay initial is before the stream emits anything. Interleave is sort of mixing upstream uh, batches in a particular order. Um, that's configurable with a, with, a, with a method, I believe. Uh, so, uh, not all big data platforms do well on this really rather um, comprehensive list of, st of stages. So, uh, there are things you need to think about um, in, in any, any integration effort. Um, <clears throat> Finally, the, uh, there are uh, two features within Aqua Streams, the async attribute and fusing which are almost anti-patterns to uh, distributing ACK streams. The async attribute, which uh, if you attended Conrad's talk earlier today, he spoke of, is uh, the ability to take a set of stages and group them in an island that's managed by one actor. Uh, fusing is a pre-step before uh, the... Um, pipeline is materialized, where all operations are, are fused together uh, as much as possible. So you're not absorbing vir virtual method calls. Uh, you're basically collecting these operations in one, one, uh, one actor. So this doesn't uh, obviously do well if you're distributing a particular Aqua Streams application that's defined a pipeline or defined a graph of operations. Um, to some degree, async works. Uh, there are uh, sort of devil in the details. You may want certain operations to occur on one JVM, the remainder of operations to occur on a second JVM in a second actor on the same machine. Kafka being a good example where locality preferences are often uh, accommodated in big data platforms. Uh, and I mentioned uh, these are uh, just actually details on the async and details on fusing. Um, I can look at 
let you look at these for a moment if you'd like. So we are working with the ACA team on, and there are uh, several uh, PRs that we're queuing up, <clears throat> um, or, or issues that we're queuing up as PRs, uh, to allow fusing to be a little more uh, flexible. So now we begin to dive a little deeper into uh, the materializer. Up till now, there's been uh, some, some hopefully fairly coherent arguments on uh, the big data platform, uh, the features it needs or moving to, and the power of Aka streams. Um, but let's talk a little about the uh, object model in Aka streams and the object model in GearPump and how uh, these two, uh, by necessity, were bridged when we distributed Aka streams. This is something that uh, if, gear, if I were to replace gear pump in this slide with Flink, for example, I would need to bridge in a similar way. So the Yaka Streams object model uh, begins with a base type of graph. Um, below that, by two levels, is a graph stage, which is effectively the workhorse of the, of the, flow, uh, the flow pipeline. A graph contains uh, something called a module, and a module contains a shape. Uh, within Aka streams, uh, you, only runnable graphs or graphs with closed shapes can be materialized. Uh, this means that your graph needs to have a source and sink. Up until then, it's a declarative, non-runnable entity that is available for reuse, if, if need be. The minute you hook up it's almost like uh, connecting into two sockets. The stream is then live, and you can materialize it. Up until then, you will get errors um, and fail fast. Uh, this, this graph is not runnable. So, so the graph itself is parameterized. Uh, this is um, a bit diluted, so it's not Scala. Uh, more of, um, I wouldn't call it UML, but pretty shapes. Uh, it's, materialized, it's parameterized by shape and uh, the materialized value, which is effectively the data that you're transporting from stage to stage. Um, the data uh, transformation or the data push is implicit and it's parameterized, which means um, you don't really need to worry about data types um, as part of the stream API. It's sort of buried implicitly in the data flow, um, you can almost think of Aka streams as more of a generic programming model where the data types are minimal, minimalized or buried implicitly in the type system. So it's still type safe, it's just being handled in a parameterized way. The uh, graph uh, takes or contains a, a module that contains a shape. The module is actually where uh, Aka Streams does its AST magic, its abstract syntax tree. The first level subtypes from graph are source, sync, flow, and, and bidirectional flow. These are the primary components when you build uh, any type of Aka Streams model. By definition, you need a source or sync, source or sync, or you can't run the graph. You typically need a series of ETL or intermediate steps that are comprise flows or, or um, pretty flows. And this is uh, more of a uh, nice, pretty diagram showing that uh, graph stage is actually two levels deep. Source, sync, flow, and pretty flow are one level deep here with graph stage with materialized value. They're all, uh, they all take parameterization uh, arguments. So below graph stage is where you get the richness of Aka streams. You're, there are literally over 50 stages. This is, uh, what does this mean? This means you get a variety of ways to dictate your flow, your data stream, and how it's processed in, in which ways than you would in a typical big data platform. You have a variety of ways to do fan-ins. You may collect, you may concat, 
you may merge. You may merge preferred. You may merge sorted. This is a richness that other big data platforms do not have. Um, and it provides a richness where less code is needed for the default application, given you may have particular ways to digest five sources or, or emit to five different types of sinks. Um, or you may need um, particular types of, uh, of ETL between the two. So uh, it's a very powerful set of, of graph stages and really provides uh, um, a, a sort of richness in programming that the other, uh, the other systems I'm aware of don't. Uh, in addition, I mentioned that each uh, the, uh, the graph stage itself is customizable. You may have a particular way of aggregating um, from the prior stage its inputs or its message stream that isn't easily reflected in these. Uh, well, you typically would cut and paste and uh, implement your own variant. Uh, there may be particular timing constraints, for example. There may be particular sliding or tumbling windows that aren't well addressed in the current set of graph stages, which actually is, is true. Uh, the uh, sliding and tumbling windows are, there is a sliding graphs, graph stage, but it's not by time. So there are a number of graph stages that pay uh, that yeah, you, would, you would probably implement uh, within big data, which, uh, we, which we've been doing. So we've talked about uh, the, the, the first uh, derivative level of subtypes, the tertiary subtypes, which are graph stage and beyond. We really haven't talked about a model, which uh, a graph holds. A model is um, somewhat of an opaque structure that is recursive and holds a set of models. Uh, it's declarative. It's used as the AST for ACA streams runtime. In other words, they take this graph you've built and they turn it into a module tree. Uh, it takes a module contains uh, a fair amount of information that is bubbled up. So your top level module has all the information that any of the sub modules contain. It's really a fairly elegant data structure, um, and it's managed uh, for the most part automatically by either um, the uh, flow operations or by the graph primitives. The, uh, some of the operators we'll, we'll see in a, in a minute. Um, so a materializer will deal primarily with the modules, um, and uh, you may need for a given module to implement certain graph stage semantics uh, which I'll get into, but you're typically going to be walking a module tree. So uh, uh, different materializers will, will be very familiar with this structure. All right, let's, let's quickly go into the gear pump object model and what that looks like. And by the end of it, uh, hopefully uh, a light will appear above your heads and uh, a sort of matchup that will be apparent in gear pumps types and um, in ACA streams types. So gear pump has a different type of graph, not to be confused with the base graph in ACA streams, which is more of a, a particular, uh, a, a typical data data structure you would expect to find in um, you know computer science 101. It's a graph that holds nodes and edges. The graph is parameterized by, uh, by uh, two, uh, two uh, parameters, a task and a partitioner. The task is gear pump's workhorse. It's similar to graph stage. It is uh, what uh, a worker runs when we distribute a set of tasks. Uh, we are distributing a set of actors. Um, a task is an implementation of an actor. The partitioner dictates what um, the actor writes to. So there's some correspondence there between gear pumps, base types, and ACA streams, uh, base types, in terms of aligning graph stages with tasks and, and edges. And here's what a task looks like. Uh, a subtype is graph task, which is actually uh, was created for ACA streams. 
Below graph task is uh, a variety of subtypes. And uh, you, may, uh, you may say, ah, that's how it works at this point. Uh, basically, we take a particular graph stage and match it with a functionality in a gear pump task. Uh, other, other big data engines would be facing a similar a sort of mapping. For example, batch or merge. You would need to have that logic inside of a particular worker. So in the declarative model, you need to map this particular declarative graph stage called merge to uh, something that can be run in a worker on a machine that, uh, that is uh, remotely running the pipeline. So let's briefly discuss materializer variations. Uh, gear pump is what I would call sort of a full mapping of graph stages to tasks. Uh, for every graph stage out there, we attempt to match it with a similar sort of a task that's running an actor. Uh, there, there are areas where there's obviously ways we do it all in one task. For example, merge, merge preferred, preferred and merge sorted uh, do not mandate the separate tasks. An alternative uh, materialization strategy is uh, given a pipeline and you've pushed a set of operations to a remote machine, you, um, you take the last N operations and have them run on that machine by the actor materializer. So you're sort of fusing together your materializer, which is distributing this pipeline, with local actor materializers, which are running the ACA streams materializer, and your fuse points or your boundaries are the data flows at where um, uh, e each one takes over. So um, in, uh, this, would, uh, this would be a way to avoid a number of the graph stages. Uh, you're just really becoming a materializer that coordinates data flow boundary points. Um, and that would be maybe a quick path if you were doing this on Flink or, or, uh, or Beam or uh, some other big data platform. You might say, well, I'm just going to coordinate this and let the active materializer do its thing on the local machine. Certainly a, a viable strategy. So let's actually get into some code. <clears throat> this is uh, a fairly, uh, it's, it's not uh, horribly simple, but a fairly straightforward example. It involves a source, a broadcast, a flow, a merge, and a sync. And uh, they're all highlighted. Uh, as a graph stage, or a set of uh, a, a graph, um, you have the source, which then is uh, sending, using, uh, seeing the uh, squiggly arrow here, uh, to broadcast, which then results in two flows um, that pass the data along to merge, which then finally sends it to sync. Um, in case you read code rather quickly and are Scala proficient, you may note that uh, I have not defined the sync actor, which is uh, up at the top, the second line. Um, so the sync actor is a fairly simple actor that's just outputting some data. Uh, so uh, running this, you would see, um, if you look at the print lines, which of, there are three, you would expect to see this output uh, on, your, on your console. Now, not to be confused with the graph stages, as I mentioned, materializers work with a module tree. If you look at how this tree is built and rendered to a materializer, it actually looks, if you glance at it sideways and turn your head, uh, you get a, a fairly flat set of graph stage modules that hold stages and uh, an actor ref sync uh, the, uh, the concept here is this is, a, this is basically what the materializer would see uh, and is um, a way to represent anything that, that you build in, um, in the ACA Streams API. 
your, material, your materializer will need to walk a module tree through. So if we uh, run this using actor materializer, um, we get this output. And if you look at the print lines again, you can see that uh, per the, where the print lines appear, either at the flows or at the sink, you see, yeah, sure enough, we're processing in the flows. Um, we are uh, confirming reception in the sink. And um, it all starts with a number from one to five, which is our source, which is broadcast and duplicated to two flows. So sure enough, you have one appearing twice in the sink. Same with two, three, four, and five. So unfortunately, uh, this is, uh, doesn't really get me too excited. Uh, I want to distribute it. Well, how would I go about doing it? Well, I replace actor materializer with a gear pump materializer. And I run it just for shucks. Sure enough, I get the same output. Uh, well, what does that actually look like? So given this module tree, uh, let's take a look at what, uh, what that looks like. So, so I'm running uh, test nine is, um, is the code you see in the deck. And uh, it's going to start up. Do a quick build, which it probably doesn't need to, and, uh, and start running. Uh, what you see here is, um, in this area, is uh, on the command line, you can say, well, dash gear pump uh, true, it'll run the gear pump materializer. Otherwise, it'll run the actor materializer. A uh, convenience in all our tests. So it ran. Uh, we are seeing, um, or should see, uh, some output. And um, I'm going to take a look at what uh, Gear Pump did. So, hopefully, so I'm bringing up a, a UI that uh, can collect metrics from, from Gear Pump, from all the workers. This is something we use quite a bit if we're looking at the gear pump uh, cluster, the workers, or a, a, a particular DAG that you're running. So, um, so let's um, go to our local host. And this is the gear pump UI. It shows uh, a master right now as it ramps up. Uh, you can also look at workers, so it's a valuable tool that we've used uh, and did use in uh, NASDAQ, which required, um, we had, uh, uh, we ran it all the way up to 48 workers, and uh, uh, it, it was, it, the UI scales uh, fairly well as well. So let's look at the app itself, which I just ran. Uh, oh, it's running, actually it's running the wrong app. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, it's running a second app, which is example three, which has a feedback loop, um, which uh, shows that in this particular instance, the feedback loop is not being handled well, um, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. I actually ran the wrong example. Um, I can uh, stop it and run the right one. Uh, In the meantime, as it's uh, running, uh, let's continue. Um, so 
So uh, let's review what the materializers do. What, what is the actor materializer doing as it traverses the module tree? Uh, in this case, this example, uh, it's working over this module tree. Well, the first thing as it traverses the module tree is it builds a runtime graph of these boundary publishers and boundary subscribers, which are all uh, compliant with a reactive API. The boundary publisher is a type is a, a type of publisher, and same with a subscriber. Um, these uh, publishers and subscribers contain an instance of the graph stage logic specific to that graph stage, and uh, there's something called an actor graph interpreter that contains an actor that is also inside the publisher and subscriber. Uh, the details of the actor materializer are uh, fairly opaque and probably should be. Uh, if you're implementing a materializer, you don't necessarily want to be doing exactly what the actor materializer is doing other than step three. You want the logic. If you're doing a balance, if you're doing a merge, you want the upstream and downstreams to reflect that particular pattern. So you, uh, you typically, as you port to a new, um, a new platform, or a different materializer, you're looking at the graph stage logic. You're not necessarily interested in what the actor materializer has done. So let's take a look at what our approach was uh, and what um, any materializer that is distributing would do. Well, first of all, it takes the module tree which uh, shown here, and it rewrites it into local and remote graphs. Um, the local is because in these examples, the print lines are locally rendered in a sort of a REPL or a, a client that's run on a particular node on the user's machine, and the remote is run distributed. So the point being, local and remote, what you dictate as local or remote, is actually a strategy you can say or tell the materializer. In most cases, in Spark and some degree Flink provide REPL environments, either through Zeppelin or, or Jupyter Notebooks, where you, want to, you provide an input and you want to see output. Um, this REPL environment is somewhat contrived in typical um, big data applications, you submit everything, including the source and sync. If you want to see what happened at the source, uh, Kafka or, or whatever, or the sync, you go to the particular logs and, and look it up there. So, um, so the default strategy of segmenting a local uh, syncs and sources and remote is slightly contrived and catered to a REPL case in many cases, you want, would want to tell gear pump materializer, take everything remote and submit it. And then once uh, it starts running, you can kill off the client and the, uh, um, a gear pump's master is off running the Aka Streams app. So in this case, Aka Streams is used as an application and is also as a submission tool, which a lot of uh, Spark or Flink jobs do something similar. So once it's segmented this into local and remote sections, uh, it inserts what are called uh, uh, bridge modules, which are basically points that arbitrate flows between machines, uh, simply put. Uh, in this case, we have a local uh, part of the graph and a remote part of the graph on potentially different machines. And uh, they're represented in the module tree or in the gear pump graph as source and sync modules. So uh, for the local graph, we just pass it to a local graph materializer. This is a materializer that is almost identical to the actor materializer. It has uh, very small changes, the objective being uh, we should have no changes. Um, and we give this um, local graph, which includes now source and sync modules to the local actor materializer to run. On the remote side, we also have uh, remote, or we have bridges, source and sync bridges, but they're turned into tasks. So as you saw earlier, uh, the different tasks that we had to implement, 
um, we have um, a graph that matches the remote module tree uh, in terms of its topology, and we're running that on, on Gearbump. So uh, once we've converted it, we're still, we still haven't done anything to run it. We submit it to the gear pump master, which then submits it to workers and executors. Uh, I should mention that from, uh, from the um, step three, where you do the, lo the remote, uh, actually five and six, could be done by any distributed uh, materializer. The, the differences are not, uh, not significant. You're basically taking part of the uh, graph, you're cleaving it at a particular point, and you're sending it off to a distribution engine where it can run its logic within uh, the, um, the, um, the, the DAG materializer. So, for example, Spark has a, 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 a DAG scheduler, and it would take a graph that looked like a Spark graph. Uh, Beam also has a runtime graph. They all take these declarative graphs and materialize them or run them in a distributed way where they have different policies about the workers and the, uh, the executors. Uh, for Flank, I think it's GearPump's master is equivalent to task manager, and GearPump tasks are also uh, Flank tasks. So, so as, this as this graph is running remotely, uh, the source bridge tasks and sync bridge tasks are your flow points back to the local graph. So, uh, so the materialization is controlled at these points. Um, as the data flows through and it hits the sync bridge task, this is then sent via actor to the, um, uh, the equivalent sync bridge module um, in the remote graph. So uh, if you have a pipeline that starts with a source that's local, a sync that's local, but the rest is remote, it basically sends source via actor to remote actor to the pipeline on one or more workers that are sending via actor, uh, often remote actor, back to the sync, which is also on your machine. So, so here's, an, here's another example, and this example is more like uh, the scenario I described where you're submitting an application, it's a non-REPL environment, you want everything run uh, remotely. In this case, uh, we are taking uh, a gear sync. This is similar to the Kafka source or, or sync stages and um, a, gear, a gear source, and everything is run remotely. Here's a more a complex one um, that was actually my example uh, and is actually showing a tree um, or a graph that was built that had a feedback loop. And you saw from the graph that uh, it resulted in some problems that uh, you, you wouldn't have a feedback loop that didn't complete or indicate the feedback loop was, was done. So in this case, it, it results in um, an, interesting, um, an interesting set of, of traffic I should mention the arrows as they fatten and the um, circles as they fatten are, in, are indicative of the, uh, the uh, message flow throughput, uh, how heavy it is. Um, the red dot you see right up here is because uh, your pump thinks the source has stalled. Uh, in case of ACA streams, sources often do complete, uh, so we would mark them as red if they're terminating. Typically in big data um, uh, platform applications, you have infinite sources. So this, in reality, practicality is not a problem. Um, the other example, uh, I'm not sure if it's worth, uh, I think I'm out of time actually, um, is, uh, is very similar to this. Uh, the graph stages we materialize visually have a strong correspondence to what you're using in, um, in your, your main, or a co strong correspondence to the, the originating graph stage and ACA streams broadcast 
flat map is um, our terminology for uh, AquaStream's map. Uh, balance is the same, merge is the same, source and sync are the same. Uh, you also have the ability to rename these both on both sides. You can progr programmatically rename them so they appear as nice names here. And uh, you can, um, by dot named, uh, rename any graph you want for metrics or, or, or whatever reasons. So, uh, so let's summarize, since, since we're out of time. Um, the AquaStreams is a really a compelling programming model uh, beyond what big, big data applications can provide right now in a, in a variety of ways. Um, it also allows uh, different materializers to, uh, to be uh, initialized and uh, these materializers would control different parts of the graph, the module tree. Uh, it's possible with a materializer to provide almost seamless conversion of ACA streams from a local single contained JVM to a distributed graph that's run across workers using remote actors. Um, the approach we use for the gear pump materializer uh, can, uh, it can serve as a template and would be uh, similarly approached in other big data platforms. And um, the, the availability of uh, what I've previewed will be in our next release, or it will be in a specific ACA uh, repro. I'm uh, attempting to convince Conrad to name it ACA-GearPump, but we'll see. Uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you. And you can approach if you have questions or ask them now. Sure. So uh, I'm just trying to uh, think back to the basics and see how do you can break the stream into remote class, local class. And uh, having a hard time trying to map that, for instance, to the very basic uh, Spark example of uh, taking input from model cases and then doing a either reduce or reduce by key, mm -hmm. you know, which goes across multiple instances and tries to summarize that data. Yep. So, So we have a group by key. Uh, we had it before um, the Yaka Streams group by, uh, and they're doing similar things. They're both doing shuffles. In Yaka Streams, it's doing shuffle with something they call a subflow or a subsource or a subsync. And uh, really, these are not uh, exactly, they have fewer operations hanging off them than your regular flow or your regular source. And the idea is you do a group by, which does the shuffle, and then you do a merge streams, which, uh, which meets at the reduce. Right, but at that point, the shuffle is remote. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, and then you continue stream locally. Yes. Right. It would be good to see that. Okay, I'll, I'll, you sure? I'll try that. Okay, great, yeah. great. Great talk, thank you very much. Sure. Something like Mesos, or, yeah. uh, it, it right now rests on Yarn, so um, you would need you would need we don't we don't really provide uh, the workers are lazy they're lazily registered so if you bring up new workers they are configured with the master or masters and they find the the master and say here I am so uh, they they can't easily scale up and down but it rests upon Mesos or Yarn or whatever resource manager uh, you've attached GearPump to. There's currently no uh, Mesos. Uh, There's not a Mesos. It's uh, TAP's next release is on Docker, um, using, or Kubernetes, actually. So we will have uh, uh, fairly soon uh, a, an elastic approach so, uh, built on, on those primitives.